Welcome to The Beat, brought to you by the Living Music Resource in partnership with the Gertrude C. Ford Center here at the University of Mississippi in Oxford. We are on a music research revolution. We are bridging the traditions of the past with the resources and technology of the 21st century. What makes us special? What makes us special is that we want to hear from you. This, is a, this experience is not just for Oxford, it's for the world. We are making Oxford the portal for this type of learning experience. So how do you participate? Chat on the YouTube chat feature, but make sure if you're watching on our website, which I hope you are, that you click on that little icon at the bottom to take you to YouTube so you can talk. Another way, email us, livingmusicresource at gmail.com, or even better, let's have some tweets. Let's have some tweets at, at livemuseres, and there will be a little prize later, potentially, for one of our Twitter followers. So what are we doing today? What are we doing today? We are finishing out this 2014-15 season with a bang. We have brought back two of my favorite people, William Bolcom and Joan Morris, a dynamic duo who have been performing all over the world for a very, well, for a significant amount of time. And they've been enlightening audiences all over. They've been doing this since 1973. Bill Bolcom, pianist, composer, charmer, and conversationalist. Joan, acclaimed mezzo, master of projecting the song, witty, funny. They have 24 recordings to their credit, Grammy Awards, Pulitzer Prize. Need I say more? I'm going to say one more thing. This is what the Chicago Sun Times says. Bolcom and Morris may be the best thing to happen to American popular music since the invention of sheet music. Let's welcome them. Hello! Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> so one of the things that I think is just spectacular about the two of you, beyond your individual artistry, is the fact that you have collaborated together in so many, at so many venues, in so many ways, and it's just, it's, it's thrilling. And I really want to focus on that today. Mm -hmm. um, would you share with us when the collaboration began? Well, uh, when we first met, uh, we had a lovely romance, and neither one of us wanted to ruin it by starting to work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but finally, I do know that people started asking us to sing. In 1972, when I met Joan, uh, I had fallen in love with a wonderful 1920 star known as the Sweetheart of Columbia Records. Her name was Ruth Etting. Uh, and there are pictures of Ruth at Etting at that age, and Joan and she resembled each other physically quite a bit. And so one of her most famous songs is Rogers and Hart's song called Ten Cents a Dance. So we realized that when we were going to parties, that uh, we had better have something prepared, so we, we would sometimes just do that one song and get out of there. Yep. Was, particularly if it was a boring party, it was a good way to get out. Um, <laughs> and finally, I think sometime in that fall, uh, I was asked by a very famous musicologist, H. Wiley Hitchcock, who was one of the founders of American musicology, that's to say the study of American music, and he asked, would we do, well, to make a, sh he, he had su suggested another cabaret star to do it. He said, well, what, what about Joan Morris? And he said, who's that? And so we'd auditioned for him. Our first show was in January 1973 at the American Musicological Society meeting at Brooklyn mm -hmm. College. Somebody was there and hired us to go to Holland's College, now Holland's University in Virginia. And we did another, then we went to the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. And then we ended up going from there to, I think, WBAI in New York, where we did yeah. a whole program like that. I had been, by the way, working freelance for Nonesuch Records. The head of Nonesuch came, Tracy Stern, and she said, I see what you're doing. And that's how we got to do our first recording. Yep. She, uh, she said, well, Nonesuch, her label was a classical label. I can't afford the royalties for Gershwin and Kern and Rogers and Hart, which is what we first performed. We, we were looking for something to do, because when I met Bill, uh, it was the same week I started a 10-week gig at the Waldorf Astoria. I had an act with a harpist. And uh, because of working with him, I had met him on a tour of a, 
uh, choral group, the Whitlow Singers. And um, Jay and I just became friends. And in New York at that time, there were a lot of street musicians. So Jay and I uh, went out into Central Park, and um, he found uh, the bottom half of a baby car carriage in the garbage. He put boards on it and braced his harp, and he tied a rope to the front. And so I would pull it, and we'd go out to Central Park, and, and I'd sit on the grass. And first time, we didn't even ask for money. A guy came up to us, gosh, you're terrific. Here's a buck. And we're like, oh, little light went on, you know. Um, so then, um, well, we had a we were the only act. We had a collection basket from his roommate was co-organist at St. Patrick's Cathedral. So I shouldn't tell this, but he clipped a little collection basket for us. So we were the only <laughs> act that had a basket lined with green felt. And my sister's husband said, it looked if anybody put in less than a quarter, a little hand would come and toss it away. <laughs> That's so. funny. That's funny. Now, the, one of the things that I love and enjoy both listening to you perform over the years and performing myself and working with students are the cabaret songs. And another key person in your collaborating relationship has been Arnold. Oh, yeah. And I, yeah. would, I would love for you to share a little bit about Arnold and just that unique bond that you had with him. We worked together 45 years I was studying in Paris with Darius Mio. I had studied with him actually in, uh, at Mills College in California. And before that, I had met in Aspen in 1957. And um, Mio went off to see his son, Daniel, sculptor and painter. He was one of my very closest friends for many years, from 1960 on to just this last October when Daniel died. But we were very close. And Daniel was a close friend of Arnold Weinstein, who was there on his second year doing Fulbright. And uh, Arnold gave this uh, libretto to Darius Mio, who took it back to Paris. I was studying with him in this tiny apartment in Pigalle. In fact, there were ladies of the evening in front of us when we went, you know, they just had moved them aside so we'd go up and study with Mio. It was, a, it's, a, it's still a place where all the porno stuff is. And so anyway, but, it, but this lovely little apartment in the middle of all that, and he said, stay after class. There will be six or seven people with me. And he handed me this libretto. He said, this is wonderful, but it's too American for me. Are you interested? Took it home. The next week I said, yes, I'd like to. And uh, we wrote Arnold, got the OK. I started composing a thing uh, which eventually would be called Dynamite Tonight. And I realized it was really not a regular opera. It was more like a, someplace between an opera and a musical, very definitely oriented toward actors singing. And uh, I had not met Arnold. I had done this whole thing over there, and a friend of mine and I got together an old reel-to-reel. -reel. That's what you had. That was a state of the art in 1961, and uh, made a tape, sent it to him in New York. Uh, didn't hear a thing. That February of 61, I got a letter from the President of the United States saying, greeting. And it's never greeting, it's always greeting, which meant I had to go and report for uh, induction uh, at a little place near the Champs Elysees. And they told me that if I went back to the States, I could sign up for the reserves and I wouldn't have to go to Vietnam, which I didn't want to do. That, in those days, the reserves did not go and fight our wars uh, overseas, nor did the National Guard. So that was all said. I was all, uh, I had signed up. I was ready to do it and so on. Then I got a mysterious phone call from Stanford University that said, uh, uh, we'll give you a doctorate and a deferment. And of course, I did that instead. So uh, meantime, I was working on this opera with Arnold. In fact, when I got on the off the boat. I had no idea where they'd even gotten my letter saying I was coming. Here was this terrific party in my honor where the great artists of New York were all seen to be present. The painters Willem de Kooning, Larry Rivers, Jane Froelich, here, all the A people, John Ashbery, Frank O'Hara, who was the organizer of all these other people to make sure we all went to whatever we were supposed to do. He would call us up. He was working at the Museum of Modern Art. He said, there's an opening tonight. Be there. We all would show up. <clears throat> Edward Albee was there, Art Morton Feldman, I think John Cage sometimes. It was just all the major artists of New York, all friends of Arnold's. And uh, well, we did that one particular first one called Dynamite Tonight. We did it at the Actors Studio Theater. And uh, Barbara Harris, who was a wonderful uh, screen and, uh, t and, and a stage actress. So if you remember the movie Nashville from Robert Altman, she was a last standing lady after Roni Blakely had been shot. Uh, and quite a story, and she was wonderful, wonderful, funny, improvisational person, and was also Arnold's girlfriend. Anyway, uh, 
We did that, and she was in Dynamite Tonight. She was the one woman in Dynamite Tonight. I remember that whole show. We did that at the Actors Studio Theater, all-star audience. Here's Leonard Bernstein. There is Judy Holliday. There is every single major person came to it. It became kind of a cult hit. Wow. And over time, we started doing other things like that. We did actually three operas for actors, not singers, because in those days, singers were not trained to be terribly interested in the singing, what they were singing about. Mm -hmm. And having had a lot of training and work in theater, language was very important to me. So uh, we did that for a number of years. And then when I met Joan, having heard her with her, uh, first of all, going to, there's a hill start right next to Delacorte Theater in Central Park. And there she was with her harpist, and I thought that was such a wonderfully brave thing to do. That's the first time I ever looked in people's eyes when I performed in the park. Um, because in college we were taught you looked above people's heads to keep your concentration. So that's what I always did. And then when you're in a play, there's that fourth wall. So in Central Park, I and I remember I had the thought, oh, they're looking at me. You know, I guess I thought because I was looking above their heads, maybe they were right. looking above my head, you know. Uh -huh. But that really <laughs> taught me something about, uh, well, Yo-Yo Ma talks about the circle, the piece, the performer, the audience. So that gave me the connection, th that energy you get from people's eyes. Mm -hmm. I think that's what made me absolutely knocked out by her because this was a wonderful actress with a beautiful voice. She was an actress who sang, and I'd been trying to deal with singers who didn't act. And mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was terribly interesting to me to be able to work with her aside from which, I mean, I was a little afraid of falling in love with her because what if she wasn't any good? You know, you know, you might be going to somebody, then you go see what they do and what happens? <laughs> I mean, that happened more than once in my life and it did to you too. Oh yeah. Yeah, and somebody you're terribly attracted to and then it turns out they're not good. And what can you do? That changes everything. Well, I was just nuts. I was just nuts about what she was doing. I thought this is the kind of singer and performer I'd been looking for all my life and there she was. So he, he wrote a song for Jay and I to do at the Waldorf called The Same Thing, The Office Girl's Lament. You were telling me about your temp work and stuff. Oh, yeah. Temp work? Yo, you were doing a lot of temp work. Oh, yeah, I sure was, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, let's yes. see. Oh, I got to sing for George Bush Sr. there at the... Uh, at the Waldorf, so I got to tell when you got your National Medal of Arts, I got to tell George Bush Jr., I sang for your dad, you know, and, <laughs> and he said, but dad's a good man. I'm like, oh yeah. You know. <laughs> so with the cabaret songs that, you know, you were created in collaboration with Arnold and this mm -hmm. idea of not only were the singers focused more on, we'll say, the, the vocal production as opposed to the theatrical connection, don't you think that was sort of something that people then weren't expecting when you came out and did these cabaret songs? Yeah, and especially it was with that name, yeah. yeah. I mean, you got to have your chops to do these. They're, they're musically yeah. quite complex. Um, I mean, I didn't get mad at Bill like I got mad at Ives one time. I remember throwing a songbook across the room. This one song of Ives, I must have counted this measure 20 times, and I couldn't get it right. Well, <laughs> anyway, but... Uh, you, find, you know, you finally did oh, one of the things I'm sorry we never had a chance to record was oh, Ives, yeah, because Ives. she did such a wonderful job. I, I did say to Bill one time, I can't count and feel at the same time, and he said, you have to. We've all heard that a little bit, maybe, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. no, it's absolutely yeah. necessary. But Arnold was just, uh, and I was in awe of him when I met him. He and Bill had kind of uh, been on the outs for a while, so I didn't meet him until, oh, we knew each other maybe a year or so. And uh, I remember you wrote him a line that ended up being in one of the Cabaret songs. He wrote to Arnold, I will never forgive you for my behavior. We're going to so, hear that tonight. Oh, yeah. that's hear right. that? what mini -cabs? Because the mini that's cabs are being performed tonight. Yeah. Not tonight, Friday night. So we're right. gonna they got scared for a second. Tonight. Friday night. Friday so night. we're anyway. gonna hear that exact line. Oh, but sure. Arnold was open. I mean, I remember when we came to finalize before we did the recording, he came out and there was one word I said, Well, this it could be this, and he changed it to have a poet be oh, so because yeah. some poets, some librettists are like, Nope, that's what's there. You don't yeah. change a word. But Arnold was he loved collaborating with, with oh, yeah, performers. Yeah. I always had two. You always Advise for singers, particularly if it's a, wrong, a note that's going to make them worry about in page three. So you just make a change for that singer if you have to. Mm -hmm. Anything so they won't worry about that dumb note because otherwise they're going to be all tied up on that note. So mm -hmm. there are things like that. But working in theater, as I had for a number of years, that was so terribly important to me. By the time I finally got the three, two of the three operas I did for Lyric Opera of Chicago, from it was a wonderful 20 years of collaboration from actually from almost 20 years, from 1986 to 2005. I did three mm -hmm. operas for them. By that time, there were increasing numbers of 
uh, opera singers who really understood theater. Mm -hmm. It hadn't been true before. And you had the wonderful people like, uh, well, Tim Nolan, Catherine Malfitano, mm -hmm. uh, all these people who really were fine actors as well. Jerry Hadley, whom I really mourn. And Lauren so many, Flanagan. Lauren Flanagan. I really had such a top, I had the creme de la creme of the really acting singers to be able to work with. That just wasn't to be found 20 or 30 years right. before that. Mm -hmm. And this has been one of the great joys because it seems to me that opera has to be theatrically viable. At least I'm only interested in that. So uh, the, Arnold was always great about that. He was always wonderfully involved with engaging. It is always a collaborative art, you know, uh, anything like that, because you're going to be depending on your performer to, to project your piece. Mm -hmm. And you want to do everything to make that possible, because if they don't, Nobody will get that piece. But we need the performers. So it's really a hand-in-hand -hand collaboration, which I love. I never particularly wanted to be a solo performer. And when Joan came into my life and we performed together, we were up there together on stage. Mm -hmm. And I loved doing that. I mean, I was a child prodigy pianist for a while, but I didn't want to be a solo pianist. I wanted to do chamber music. And when I started working with you, that to me was my meat. And the sad part, of course, is this is our last year of touring. Yeah, we, we just decided, you know, our dear friend Max Marath said to me, uh, I was complaining about five years ago about Bill had to transpose so many things down, and I was thinking of retiring. He says, Joni, you'll know. You'll know when it's time. So we, um, when we got ready for this tour, I, I was having issues already, but I thought, oh, by the time I get up on stage, it'll be okay. But it wasn't, you know. I was trained first as an actress, so yeah, I can give a good performance, I can <coughs> put a song over, I can still do that, oh, sure. but I don't have the tools I did. You know, I don't want to disappoint people because there are certain things I relied on my voice to do. Holding a note at the end, I just don't have the breath to do that. I'm, I'm still learning material though. I'm learning a Sophie Tucker song because it's all spoken called You Can't Sew a Button on a Heart. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that, and, and our secretary came up with a good phrase. She says, well, now you'll do cameo appearances. There you go. Yeah. And the thing is, I said this to you yesterday, the wealth of knowledge and experiences and things that you have to share with people is so immense that, I mean, there's just going to be so much to offer in that way, too. Oh, well, you. let's transition. Um, we, today we're doing something different here at the Beats. This will be our first time we have live music during one of our live streams. And in preparation for your visit, uh, an Oxford-based composer and pianist, Price Walden, has written a new work for eight solo voices. And today, members of the University of Mississippi Concert Singers are going to premiere this work. It's called To a Stranger. Price shared that he's always been drawn to the poetry of Walt Whitman and decided to take Whitman's frame and idea, but fill it with modern texts. The piece is filled with little stories starting either with I am or you are. Price wanted to give voices to all the things we really wish we could say to one another. So let's get ready for Price with a little clip, and when we come back, we'll have these singers. <laughs>
Price here. So, um, as I said, members of the UM Concert Singers and local composer Candace Price here, and we just want to get some feedback. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm going to sit between. I don't know. Okay. What do you call that? Referee. Yes, referee. Mm -hmm. um, could you get uh, most of the words yes. in the audience there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What I found very touching is how uh, individual some of you came. You really looked concerned when you were telling her, you know, uh, I forget what the exact line was, but the relationships, that was marvelous. Mm -hmm. um, I've never heard a piece quite like this. Uh, I suppose if you were able to do it from memory, you could even engage in, you could hold a hand out to someone or, 
you know, withdraw when you say certain things, which would make it quite effective too. Yeah, a little staging would. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. just to, but but they'd have to all know it by heart, which I don't right. think would be that hard because you made basically a very simple kind of music. Mm -hmm. That's all it needs to be, and uh, no, it had a very definite aura about it, and. Uh, I have to say, we were both quite struck by it. So yeah. bravo, young man. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah. And of course, people say, well, you are fat. Like that. It was, these are things people wouldn't dare to say. Anybody else, of course, would even though they might think it. So that was okay. It was, I guess what it is, everybody was singing what they thought, but would never actually yeah. vocalize. Uh -huh. And uh, it was quite interesting in that kind of way. But it was all basically on the same kind of D major scale, and it was very, almost kind of minimalist in that kind of way. Uh, sometimes there were places where I was a little worried, and I saw that there were some places where people weren't quite sure how to find their pitches. Mm -hmm. And uh, I suppose the only caveat I would have is maybe you should find ways for them to feel more comfortable uh, give them a little hint someplace as to where to find the pitches. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't too often, but there were a couple of places when I looked at the score and it wasn't what I was hearing <laughs> because the person was having trouble finding the note. Yeah. So you really have to, uh, I know years and years of, well, this is one of the things that in Britain, for example, in all his operas, Brenton in Britain, he always gives the singer a pitch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things. I've always told everybody I ever taught, Coddle your singers. You will be glad that you did. Say that again. Say that again. Coddle your singers. You should always be glad they did. The other thing about singers versus the average uh, instrumentalist is that if you play the piano or the trumpet or something like that, you probably start when you're a kid. Many, many people find out they have a voice when they're about 18. Mm -hmm. That means there will be even famous people are always going to be insecure about having not the same command of rudiments and yeah. simple stuff and nuts and bolts that you would have had with an instrument maybe 10 years earlier, but then you're 18. It's like learning a language. The later it is when you learn a language, the harder it is. And so there's always an insecurity. So that's really one of, one of the reasons you want to give them every kind of sense of being safe because they are worried about it. I mean, there are places, I mean, France is full of uh, small choral groups in which everybody has to have perfect pitch to be able to be in them. And they can sing the most absolutely difficult music and don't have to worry about where the note is, but they have it in their heads. Most people don't have that. And I've worked with all kinds of singers, famous ones and so on. And I've noticed when they write in little note changes, they look like five-year-olds doing it. In other words, they're not, they're, not used to, they're not used to the same thing and they're always a little bit insecure. So the biggest thing you want to do is to reassure them. What you're interested in anyway is in how well they do. And you, know, and you want them to feel comfortable so all the best thing that they can do can have a chance to come out. Absolutely. I know you were worried about all these things and I never. Oh, gosh. Well, yeah. when, when you came onto it late. Yes, I sure did. I, um, like most singers I know. And, and I had, uh, well, I went to a Catholic school, so the nuns, I learned piano, but it was all by rote. But I did know how to read music when I went to college. But, yeah. you know, some, uh, I remember after every theory class, I would go to St. Aloysius and cry because I felt so, it was like if you only had arithmetic, having to go to calculus or something. It just right. didn't uh -huh. relate to me. Yeah. And Bill never made me feel insecure about that or anything. This, just what he's telling you. He knew that was true for me. Um, I could see when you rehearse this sometime, before you have it memorized, make up your own things. See what you'd say. Then when you go back to the excellent, because you covered quite a wide range of things, acceptances and, you know, really things people don't like to talk about in polite company, abusive relationships, fat, you know, all this. Oh, yeah. So, but make up your own things just to see where the stresses are in the music, where you would say something really strongly to the person or where you would say it kindly. Mm -hmm. But make up your own phrases uh, before you memorize this. That's, that's what I would suggest. I want to, to commend Price realize. in the process of this piece happening. It was neat to, in the rehearsal, and feel free to chime in. They had moments when they were practicing where they brought some suggestions to Price, not in changing big things, but in yeah. approach because of what came to them organically through the experience of sharing this. The one point where they all were unison wasn't originally written as such, and they just felt this sense of each character finally, it was it was building, it was building, and then they were together. And yeah, I came into rehearsal on Friday, and they were like, we have this idea, and tell us if you hate it. <laughs> um, and then they were like, one choir sings, uh, I'm going to hell for this. And the other choir was like, what if we also sing, you are going to hell for this at the same time. And so we're all at unison at this 
it's kind of the middle point of the piece. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's way better than anything I could have thought of. <laughs> so you're a collaborative composer. Oh, absolutely. That's absolutely. So Singers are always smarter than I am. <laughs> <laughs> they know way more about singing than I am. Well, the other so. thing about it is I can hide behind my piano feeling dreadfully like death warmed over. You are your instrument if you sing yeah. it. And mm -hmm. you are absolutely naked to the world. There's nothing to be hidden. There you are. You have nothing between you and them. Mm -hmm. I remember one time we were doing a show with a wonderful cabaret performer named Dave Frischberg, who was based in Portland now, your home yep. city. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, he has been used to playing the piano and singing over it. And there's a wonderful, funny song called My Attorney Bernie. So you and he were performing together, and you were both of you were standing in front of the audience, and I'm playing the piano, and you're doing my attorney Bernie. Dave allowed us how he was so nervous performing without a piano between him and the audience. Mm -hmm. And I had to understand that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, anything you want to add about the process as being the conductor, <clears throat> Jessica? I mean, Jessica was, was the one who prepped this group. She's a graduate student here. And I mean, so we had that collaborative aspect too, you know, between Price. And Price also, I, I deviate for a second, Price had this journey with the text, which I thought that was really interesting. You know, initially looking for something specifically Walt Whitman, yeah. and then sort of basing it on this concept of Walt Whitman poetry. So there was that sort of, you were collaborating with yourself. Um, and then, um, yeah, I just thought about how that sounded. And then um, we had the collaboration with Jessica, and then also with the singers. I mean, how was it for you, Jessica? Um, when Dr. Trot first approached me about conducting this, I wasn't quite sure what I was getting into uh, when I agreed, but I'm so glad that I did. Um, when I first uh, got the piece in hand, um, trying to play through it was interesting because um, you have eight separate voices singing all different things, and I don't have that many fingers. Um, and I also had never heard it, too, and I always like, conductors like to hear a recording before they perform it. Um, the first rehearsal, I will admit that it was kind of rough. You guys agree? Yeah. It was kind of rough. We had to uh, separate quite a bit, but by by the end of the second rehearsal, we were able to get off uh, learning notes and rhythms and try to focus more on musicality and phrasing and then developing characters. And I really have to um, just give an applause to these guys for coming up with their own characters because that's not something that I did. That's something that they looked at the text and took it home and, and looked at what they were trying to say and came up with right. what they needed to do to portray that to an audience. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we only had a total of It's good and bad about listening to a recording of something. You can't help but be influenced by how that person has interpreted the piece. Mm -hmm. And you really have to kind of forget about it. I mean, when you're learning something that you had heard before, right. there's a I, very quick time. I find that there's a point I have to stop listening mm -hmm. uh, early on in the process. Otherwise, it stays with you too strongly. And there's so many singers I've admired that I want to listen to. How did they bring it up? In fact, when I go back home, I'm going to listen to Ruth Bedding do Shaking the Blues Away, which is the one I'm working on now, just one more time. Because I used to listen to her all the time. But I don't want it to inform what I do. And remember, every character, yes, you're creating a new thing, but all the elements come from you. Unless you have felt those things, you can't make it up. You know, don't don't, don't imagine you're going to share oh, what your mother did or what your girlfriend did. It is you. Mm -hmm. That's the only story you have to tell, is your story. Mm -hmm. But a, that's what the audience wants from you, what Salinger called your loot. Yeah, that's a wonderful <laughs> phrase. Uh, for about maybe five or six times with a very good friend, Richard Tilling, has the point. We put together a, a, sh a kind of a course called Words and Music. These were student poets and student composers. Unfortunately, they had to be grad students. I wanted to have the younger ones, but that was unfortunate. The English department wanted it that way. And we taught them, really, to how to collaborate. And we couldn't pay any singers. We couldn't pay any pianists because there wasn't any kind of money for that among the students. But the students just came to our class. They became groupies because they could be the first to sing something. Mm -hmm. They were on the ground floor of the creation of something. They had a hand in it. Yep. They were able to, uh, and both the composer and the poet had learned to bend to each other, mm -hmm. as well as to the performers. There are things that are just not worth the difficulty. Mm -hmm. and there are other things that maybe, as you say, is a, a singer will think of something, as you found yourself, <laughs> Price, that you wouldn't have thought of yourself. That's one of the things when you've worked with theater, where everything is kind of up for grabs, and you begin to feel that this, 
the text is necessarily sanctified, you're going to want to work with it and you want to play with it. We now know that Shakespeare plays were collaborative efforts. Very few, I mean, all the troupe of the people in the plays contributed to much of the dialogue of the great plays of Shakespeare. So they were collaborative efforts, just the same way as Second City, Paul Sills were was a collaborative yeah. effort, and, and uh, we have a history of collaborative improvisational theater in America, but they did it back in Elizabethan times too, so there you are. It wasn't just one person's, hey, I'm the great genius, and I'm going to do it, and you have to do exactly what I say. I love the idea of give and take. It's much more fun. <laughs> Absolutely. And yes. how cool to have a world premiere on your recital. You know, make friends with a composer and a poet and say, hey, do something tailored to me. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's what's that going to cool? happen. So Jessica, this is going to be on her graduate recital. They'll all be memorized, right? Wow. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. You can actually find a kind of way of, you know, maybe moving across each other like people are walking in the stage, mm -hmm. maybe on the street, somebody Ooh. walking by, and you know, you see somebody you'd love to talk to, but you know, you can't because yeah. they're moving by and they'll, they'll probably get offended or scared if you try to say something to them, yeah. mm -hmm. but in your mind, this is what you'd love to say to that person walking by. Mm -hmm. So you might have fun with moving it around a little bit, you might mm -hmm. choreograph it a little bit just mm -hmm. for that yeah. kind of way. It should be all something that you work on together, yeah. Yeah. and right. this should be fun, and that's the... To me, the joy is collaboration. Oh, absolutely. Day, anytime. But, but have someone out there to watch. You know, Jessica could do that for you. Just taking someone's hand can be just so touching. You know, or else, you know, you hear so just turning your back mm -hmm. when you hear something that hurts too much, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Keep it simple. Keep it direct. Because there's a lot of complex ideas being thrown at the audience. But I think those you know, those things will suggest themselves yeah. when you work on it. <laughs> well, something I love about the piece is that it does it, it points it makes you want to chuckle a bit, <laughs> and it points it it's very heart wrenching, yeah. and it just it sort of takes you all over. So the specificity might um, focus that in a bit. Something yeah. I would ask both of you. So as composers, um, how much do you think about the collaboration with your audience? Just curious, as a young up and coming composer, <laughs> as a young superstar, how do you? Um, <laughs> how I do love you, being thought of as young. You are. Heaven takes. How I mean, how much do you think about that? Is that part of your process in ah. the collaboration? My answer is kind of a lot, and then not at all. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> because, kind of close, right. Um, you always want to kind of affect the audience in some way that's part of what you want to do, but then you have to not think too much about affecting the audience and then writing what you actually want to write. Right. Uh -huh. um, yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I it this way. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, that's all absolutely on the nose. I figured this way, if I try to bend something to fit my audience, there's always this whiff of condescension in that. Mm -hmm. People have a feeling when they're being talked even the slightest bit down to. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to talk down to anyone. What I've decided is to try to develop my own personal audience self. What part of me as an audience, not just me writing it, I sort of have to sort of stand back from what I'm doing a little bit to be able to imagine what I'm, I want to hear this. I want to hear this thing the way it is. And me as an audience, I appeal to the me inside of me that is the audience person. And that's the way I think it always works. I can't try to presuppose what the audience is going to want. I never wanted to do any kind of pabulum sort of thing. I think we have a tendency now, especially in a time when you order something from Netflix and somebody gives you 20 films you're supposed to like. Well, I get very angry at that. I don't want to be told what I'm supposed to like. <laughs> you know, and, and now now with now with Google, they, they, they know when you breathe and when you sneeze. And, you know. and I want to interject here. I get annoyed with the whole Pinterest thing, too. Because God forbid you have a good idea on your own. Everyone's like, oh, you must have gotten that on Pinterest. And I'm like, no, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what Pinterest is. Well, but... don't look at it. I did not get that. your own mojo phone. No, I tell you, I stay away from all of that. Simply because I don't want them to know what I want. <laughs> I really don't. But I mean, I know what I want. Right. And I think that's the whole thing. I think what you really find out eventually is what would you like to hear? What would you yeah. like to have made? Because this is something you really had always wanted to have happen. It's not a question of buying a great creator. I think sometimes 
We get into terrible trouble when we try to impress ourselves. That's when we get into the big quandaries of our life. That's when we get ourselves the loggerheads, when you want to impress yourself. That's when the beginning of the end happens. You need to learn not to do that. Yeah. Because it's not a question of impressing yourself. It's a question of being able to make something that you've always wanted to have in the world. And so you do it that way. You have to please yourself. But that part of yourself, which is the audience self, mm -hmm. not the part that is yeah. self-vaunting, but the part mm -hmm. that, gee, this is what I really meant to have exactly as I can. The more you work on it, the the more you get maybe a little bit closer to what you want. It's really a matter of, uh, well, essentially pleasing that part of yourself, which is to do with the part of us that we all share. Yeah. There is a common humanity. If you please that part of yourself, which ties in with you and you and you and you and me and all the rest of that, then you might possibly actually please someone. But that's that's a byproduct. Yeah. That isn't what you're doing it for. You're doing it because you want to hear something that hadn't existed before. That's when those kids would come in, not being paid. They wanted to be able to create something that was new, right. something that had not existed before. Mm -hmm. And that's the excitement of it all. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, I can talk about uh, the piece was a week late because for so long I wanted to write something that was kind of really could show off what I could do and I wanted to impress people and stuff like that. And then the minute, the minute I divorced myself from this is the situation where this is, piece is going to happen and thought about what piece I kind of needed to write and wanted to write and wanted to hear, that was when it all kind of flowed. You stopped trying to impress yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that, is, that is one thing you have to always watch in your own things. That's when people go astray. When great stars, we've seen several people fall from their heights in the last few months. That's because they lost that perspective. And we need to be sure. I, I was just thinking about some other people uh, that have had that trouble. I'm thinking of someone like Kathleen Battle, whom I met about four or five years ago. She really destroyed her own career, and she was really quite contrite. And I felt terribly sorry for her, but she's a great star, but she got in, process, in the process of impressing herself. And that is how she lost her way. I would love to have more of this being talked about in schools of performing, because what happens to you if you suddenly become famous? How do you keep your perspective? Right. And that's mm -hmm. a major thing to be talked about early in life because you never know what might happen to you. Think, oh my gosh, famous! All my solve, all my problems will be solved. No, you suddenly run into a whole host of other, much worse ones that you have no preparation for, and then you could completely go bonkers. You lose your sense of anything, mm -hmm. and this is where I think people at least have to think about it. You're not going to be able to forestall every terrible crisis, but you should have a little. At least something of an idea of the problems that will happen when you suddenly do make it. And I don't think anybody really talks about it because the people who lost it are the ones who lost that sense. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a good point. Well, I want to give a congratulations to this group, but I want to introduce everybody. I didn't do this before. Right. Brent Strauss. We have Chloe Sturges. Cody Arthur. Sergio Vergara. We have Zane Lynn. Anna Greenlee. Jessica Taylor. Claudia Salcedo and Hannah Gad, Price Walden, and I also want to thank Don Trott for putting this group together. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. All right, we are going to shift. We are going to learn a little bit more about Bill and Joan in a little uh -oh. more relaxed manner right now. Uh, we're going to play a game. So I need all of the dream team to come up. We have two teams that we're going to have here. And this game is called Tall Tale Teller. And we're going to have two teams. We're going to have nothing or is it nothing but trouble? <laughs> nothing but trouble. And we're going to have all about that base over here. <laughs> and the way the game works, let you all get into position. The way the game works, we are going to tell two truths and one lie. And then the teams are going to try to guess which is the lie. You don't have to, obviously, we'll then know what the truths are. So you're just going to raise your mic when you think you know. If you get it right, you get two points. And if you pass, it goes to the other team, and they can possibly get one point. OK? So I'm going to go first. I don't know what I want to say. Um, OK, here are my three. I, I have sung in a male prison. I have sung for Bill Clinton, and I 
have performed with Bill Bolcom. Yes, Shalene. I think the lie is that you sung in a male prison. Wrong. <gasps> I think that you performed with Bolcom. Wrong yet again. Oh. I actually, back in my undergrad, the church where I was freelancing, decided to visit a prison and wanted uh, me to sing a solo. Quite the experience. I'll never forget the pastor pulling me aside and saying, make sure you're covered up to here, make sure you're covered up down here, wear gray, and just blend it. But I got the biggest standing ovation I've ever had in my life. I'm telling you, and it was the most Whoa. boring Presbyterian hymn wow. you could ever imagine. But you would have thought I was like Mariah Carey. So that is a truth. My parents were not happy with me uh, that I did that. And then I have, at the NOA convention, Back in 06, we did a more together. Back in 06, oh, wow. I know. Hopefully, you haven't blocked it out. And uh, so the lie was. I have to admit, I'd forgotten. Hard. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't make a good enough impression. Of it. Um, so the lie was about Bill Clinton. Well, I stumped them. So do I get a point? Oh. All right, Bill, your turn. Try three with them. See if they can guess. I was the tiddlywinks decathlon champion of the Seattle schools. I co-starred at the age of six with the cabaret star Hildegard. And also, I was voted boy most likely to succeed in high school. <laughs> oh, I think Heather's up first. Um, the performing with Hildegard? No, that was what actually did happen. Oh, they get to guess, they get to guess. Boy most likely to succeed. I also was voided. <laughs> oh, yeah, wow. you're doing very well, but we're, you're learning things about us, yeah? You get a point. Well, good. You get a point. All right, Joan, lay it on. Lay it um, on, Joan. My grandma had a band with Lawrence Welk in it. Um, I won a beauty contest as a baby. My grandpa worked for the czar. Go ahead, Heather. Okay, not that we don't think you could, but the beauty contest as a baby? That's right. <laughs> oh, I did it, so they get two uh, points. No good as a liar. Darn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I'm going to- My wonderful collaborator, Arnold Weinstein, had a great knock, knock joke he thought up. Knock, knock. Who's, Who's there? there? Who's there? Help, I just forgot it. You might know. <laughs> oh, uh, all I can think of the one is Mustafa Ben Abdullah Bo. Yes, that's it. Mustafa Ben Abdullah Bo. Mustafa Ben Abdullah Bo who? Mustafa Ben Abdullah Bo, baby. Ah, <laughs> funny. Are right, we going to go around right. one more time? So you guys have two points, yeah? All right, let me, let me try. What are mine? What are mine? What are mine? Okay. Um, ah, what are mine? Most of you know this, but uh, I, was a I was a contestant on Wheel of Fortune. I was on the softball team in high school, and I attended Madonna's birthday party in Miami. Yes? Softball team. You saw me through me. I was totally too shy to play group team sports. The other two are truths. By accident, I got to go to Madonna's birthday party in Miami years ago. Yeah, wow. it was quite the spectacle. Jeez. She wanted an opera singer to meander around through the party. She had all these, she had like, jugglers and, and trapeze artists, and she wanted random opera singers. So I got to, I got to go. It was pretty cool. <laughs> Good. Well, you guys got that one, yeah? yeah? Good job. All right. You're up, Bill. I've got to think of three more? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I just worked on those three. <laughs> We're going to put you on the spot. Oh, boy. I'm going to have to think a little bit. My God. That's really going to be hard. Somebody well, should else I go? go? Okay, I'll go. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, you didn't tell me. <laughs> oh, I didn't. <laughs> um, I can make a wonderful souffle. Um, I appeared in a show with Barry Manilow. I have eaten so much chocolate, I got sick. <laughs> Shaleen? Chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> Forever, forever. Something that we definitively know yeah. she is 
you're not a good liar, which oh, is, I, which doesn't, I, 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 you know, you're no. just, you're, you're open, but, honest. So fill me in here about the Barry Manilow. Um, I was in an off-Broadway show before I knew Bill uh, called The Drunkard. Mm -hmm. And Barry Manilow was music director, best accompanist before I met Bill. He knew when to be there for you, when to pull back. Um, and he had an act with a girl, I don't know, it, it was before Bette Midler. Um, and, uh, oh, uh, yeah, he, so he was music director, so that's it. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you want to go, Bill, or should we, do you want to, do you have three, or do you want to call it quits right here? I think I want to call it quits. Call I it can't quits? think of anything funny enough. I'm sorry. Oh, I, oh, I, oh, I, <laughs> I find that hard to Since I have leave. a moment, I will say one thing. The idea of getting eating too much chocolate, your sister did. She had all those Malamars, <laughs> oh. which are all covered with chocolate. Oh, that's right. And, uh, and she ate so many, she'll never eat another one, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, my goodness. So, wait, I think we have winner over here. Yes. All about all right. that base one. Woohoo! Uh -huh. We got surprises. Radar. And can we get the top? Oh, wait, who was the best liar? Uh, who was the best liar? I think it's a tot. Give it to Bill. Give it to Bill. <laughs> Give it to Bill. You can get the tall tale teller. Tall tale teller. Oh my goodness. I worked so hard on my truths and lies that I couldn't think of any more of them. <laughs> Claudia, our, our art specialist here, we have, the, since we're liars, we have our musical liars. So wow. Shanae, That's wonderful. Oh, I love it. Winner, you win, win, win. Musical oh. liars. <laughs> so I'm crowning you. Crowning you, very good judgment you have. Very good judgment, you shall succeed. You shall succeed. Thank you, Cody. Oh. All right, give him a hand, thanks guys. All right, we're gonna wrap things up here, wrap things up. First thing I wanna say is make sure you take the time to join LMR. Uh, by joining livingmusicresource.com, you stay up to date on our activities and events that we're going to be holding. And we'd really love some suggestions from you as to what other artists we should bring or whether we should keep bringing back Bill and Joan, which I think is a great idea. Um, I don't want to say too much too soon, but next season, our focus is going to be on the singing athlete. And really, you know, Ole Miss, very much known for sports, and we're going to correlate the sports sports athlete with the singing athlete. We're gonna do that hotty toddy for musical purposes, which I think is a really good idea. Don't you think? Don't you think? All right. Um, I want to thank lots of people. I want to thank um, my LMR intern, Heather Higginbotham. Come, I guess, come on back up. I want to thank Claudia Salcedo, who has done an enormous amount of jobs today. Megan Brock, Shaleen Sugar, Carly Reeder, Rachel Dennis, Katie McLaughlin, Cody Arthur, Melanie Coolhane, and Hillary Smith. We actually added a man to our group now. I'm not sexist. Um, right. I want to thank the University of Mississippi. I want to thank the Ford Center for producing this with us in partnership. I want to thank Sneed's Ace Hardware, Sarah Hamilton at Sheree Matthews Real Estate, the Inn at Old Miss, and the Music Department. I also want to thank again Don Trott for helping make this, this musical experience happen today. Looking ahead, we want to have more music performances on the beat. Great job on that to a stranger. All right, someone on their seat. Might be you, Richard, up there. Do you have a sticker? I remembered what chair I put it on. <laughs> so Bill and Joan have very graciously signed. I love this cartoon of you two. Oh. It's just so fantastic. They have graciously signed this, and you get to win it, Richard. <laughs> Woohoo! And then someone on Twitter is also going to get the other one. We're going to share that with you. Now, something super special. Yesterday when they arrived, it was Joan's birthday. And she is 29. Yet again. And we just um, were tickled to have her here for her birthday. So I would like to ask, can we all sing happy birthday to her together? Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Joan. Good grief. Happy birthday to you. This lady, this lady has a huge heart. It is no surprise that your birthday is close to Valentine's Day. Oh. And I figured we can we can celebrate when we finish up here. Sorry, folks watching on the web, you don't get a piece of chocolate. Oh. But here, maybe we'll share. So now it we'll won't be a lie. I can eat too much chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So we're gonna we're gonna have a little party here with Joan. So thank you for watching. Remember, the research revolution continues. Woo! Wow, we really are. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.